um, mi nombre es Marcy Stein. Estoy muy contenta de estar aquí. That's it for my Spanish. That, that and cerveza, por favor. Right? That's what I have for you. Um, I was asked to come talk about follow through. And in talking about follow through, I'm going to talk about direct instruction. Um, and I'm going to start with the research support, and then I'll get into the details about direct instruction after that. Um, if you wanted to know more about direct instruction and follow through, this is the book. And I don't know whether you guys can translate this book or not, possibly. This is an amazing book. This is a book that was written by John, Jean Stockard and her colleagues about 50 years of research on direct instruction. I know of no other approach that has that breadth of research uh, on um, the efficacy of its, uh, in, you know, the outcomes from, from using direct instruction. It's an amazing document. Um, and, and Jean and her colleagues chronicle, you know, where direct instruction started, how it evolved, where it is now, and they really summarize an amazing amount of research. It's interesting to note that this is 50 years of research. And oh, by the way, I kind of have been involved for maybe 30 of those, almost 30 of those years. I was lucky enough to um, get a master's degree. Um, I was funded to get a master's degree at University of Oregon where the direct instruction pe people landed. They started at University of Illinois. They moved to University of Oregon. And I went to University of Oregon to get a degree not knowing anything about direct instruction until I took my first class. And then it was like, it was just amazing. I knew I didn't know, I knew I what, didn't know how to teach. I didn't know what I didn't know. You know that feeling, I know there's something, but I'm not sure what that is. So I was fortunate to come get a master's degree with these people, and then I worked for follow through. I started in as a consultant, I became a project manager, Later, I became a director of another follow-through, another model follow-through, related model follow-through. So my, I'm here because of my mentors um, who created this amazing approach to, direct, uh, approach to teaching. Um, project follow-through was the largest and most expensive organized experiment conducted by the US government ever. It eventually it, it, um, reached over 100,000 kids in 180 different communities, and all of these communities in which follow-through was implemented were poor communities. These were communities for kids who had incredible economic challenges. Um, and they spanned the range of poor kids in the United States. Um, there were um, Latina sites, there were uh, Latino Sites, there were Native American sites, there were poor, poor white children sites, there were urban African American sites, there were rural African American sites. My sites, when I started, I went to a, a site in Flint, Michigan, a kind of a poor city, poor community. You may have heard it was in the news about how bad their water was for many, many years. That was Flint, Michigan. I went to Williamsburg County, South Carolina. At one time, it was the poorest county. United States and worked in five schools there where we implemented. So I was able to follow through, reached a range of children. There were nine major models in follow through. And let me back up. Follow through was called follow through because it came after Head Start. Hands. Head Start, is that a familiar term to anyone? No. Oh, okay. Head Start was a preschool program funded by the US government. Right? So lots of funds went into poor communities for preschool. Uh, and there were you know, um, some nice gains. It, was, it ended up being more of a social service. Kids got, got um, welfare checks and doctors and dentists and breakfasts and lunch. And it was really a great, it was meant to be an enrichment program. And at the time, there wasn't enough money to, from the government to continue that in elementary school. So the U.S. government said, um, let's, just, let's just fund some models and find out what works best. So follow through was following Head Start. And it followed Head Start into K through three. 
right, kindergarten through third grade. What's really unique about follow-through is that every follow-through site had a matched control group doing just business as usual in that same community. That's very important. And, and then you need to know how, how was the effect, and just how were the kids' progress um, measured? They were measured by basic skills measures, by cognitive measures, and also by effective measures. How well did the kids, how good did the kids feel about themselves, right? Um, I'm gonna show you some results of this first analysis, I think. Oh, each site, here's some more information. Each site was con um, matched to its control site, okay? Here's the follow-through implementation, here's the match control, same community, same population, um, and they determined that a, a difference was to significantly, an outcome was declared significant if the difference between the follow-through implementation and the community um, implementation, if, if that was um, statistically significant, and if the effect size was 0.25 or larger. Those were the criteria used to judge whether or not the follow-through kids did better. Who did better, right? Um, and the percent of significant outcomes was then computed, okay? This is what it looks like. At zero, the follow-through kids and the, and the matched control kids, no differences. Above the line, significant differences. Below the line that you see up there, that meant that the kids in the matched control group performed better than the kids in the experimental group. Take a look. There's direct instruction model. There were nine major models. The direct instruction model, the parent education model, they kind of bypass the schools, behavior analysis model, Southwest Lab, Bank Street, you can read, read the rest of the models. Um, and there was only one model that outperformed their, their match controls over and over and over again. Um, and that was the direct instruction model. And they outperformed their match controls in all three types of measures. In the basic skills measure, in the cognitive skills measure, and in the affective measures. Um, in fact, this is kind of interesting. I was on a plane going back to Oregon with the director of follow-through who had just seen the preliminary results from the, from the study. This was a 10-year, was evaluated at the end of 10 years of implementation. And Wes Becker, who was the director of follow-through, said what was very interesting is that the rest of the directors, the project directors, thought, oh, well, okay, fine, basic skills measures, that's what those people do. They were a little surprised at the cognitive measures, and they were outraged that our kids felt better about themselves than any of the other kids in the other models. And the only thing they could say was, oh, I think there's something wrong. We think there's something wrong with the measures. Now, we knew that because, and Carl talked about this earlier, because actually, how do you get kids to feel good about themselves? You actually ensure that they're successful and then they feel good about themselves, all of our kids felt good about themselves. I mean, they really understood what they were learning and, and how, we, 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 that's how we taught them. Look how smart you are. Look what you can do now. That was part of the model. Um, a quote from, um, from Jean Stockard, in contrast to the opinions stated by the critics, the critics, how could this be right, Students taught with DI had higher scores on tests of intellectual ability and developed stronger and more positive self-views. Not a surprise to us, right? That, but it was a surprise to everybody else. How can these kids in this very structured, which I'm gonna tell you about, very structured systematic program, how can they possibly feel good about themselves? Teacher and parents saw the programs as highly effective and would recommend them to others. This is from that book that I was talking about, Gene Stockard's book. There was another analysis that was done. All the outcomes from the sites were averaged. So all of our sites in, in our direct instruction follow through, every model had to have at least three sites that I know of. We had way more than three sites. We were all across the country, all across the United States. I, I don't have the number at my fingertips, I'm sorry, but many, many sites. Um, and the results were compared to um, the 20th percentile. That was the estimate at where K-12 
kids who were um, experiencing economic um, challenges, kids from poor communities, it was estimated that they walked through the door at the 20th percentile. Where were middle class kids? Right up at the 50th percentile. And here's what those data look like, right? Direct instruction, look at the rest of the models. Blue is reading, the green is math, and the, and the um, purple is language. Our kids outperformed everyone else, right? when averaged across sites. They, they, they got the closest to what middle class kids look in America than anybody else. Here's something that people don't talk about a lot. The model at the time, this was a, a, conducted a long time ago and it was well funded, had a teacher and it had two, our model had two paraeducators, right? The teacher taught reading, one paraeducator taught math, and one paraeducator taught language. Look at the data, look at the results from the math and the language. Those results come from instruction from paraeducators who were not certified teachers. That's an amazing finding. And you kind of want, you have to ask yourselves, well, how does that happen? How could these paraeducators, right, um, produce these amazing results? And that's the second part of this talk. I'm going to tell you how they did that. I'm going, to, I'm going to suggest that it's the model that has several components in it, and there's one in particular, one component, that most people misunderstand, and I'm going to try to talk to you about that one today, and I'm going to use only math examples. I was asked to kind of, instead of reading, everybody talks about reading, so I'm going to talk about math and what we did to teach kids math and those grades. Oh, this is... There's also direct research on um, direct instruction math programs, and this was an analysis that was done by Gary Adams and um, Siegfried Engelman way back when, and shows the effect sizes of, of particular studies that involved math programs. Um, it, I, I think I didn't mention this, and it needs to be said from the very beginning. The philosophy, the drive, the whole purpose of direct instruction, the whole, the whole what we based everything on is, is, was developed by Siegfried Engelman in the 1960s at University of Illinois when he was trying to figure out the best way to teach kids. He actually wasn't an educator. He came from advertising. He wanted his, his bosses said, hey, how can we sell more candy bars? He wanted to find out what kids looked at when they looked at an advertisement for a candy bar, and he started thinking about how kids were thinking about the input that they were getting, how they were learning, what, what they were learning. Um, so Engelman started this direct, he developed the um, direct instruction approach, all based on the premise that all kids can learn if they're given well-designed instruction. All kids can learn. That's the bottom line. The responsibility for ensuring that kids are successful lies with the teacher, lies with the system. And that was very appealing to me, but they don't just talk about all kids learning. They basically um, defined what well-designed instruction looks like. What, what does that look like? What does it have to look like in order for kids to be successful? Um, You've heard the term direct instruction a lot, I'm assuming. You've heard um, people talk about it. You've heard explicit instruction. Research Ed talks a lot about all of these things. There's a wonderful article written by Charlie Hughes um, and his colleagues in Pennsylvania, and it's sort of a history of explicit instruction. And he discusses the difference between what we call, the Engelman people call, big DI, capital DI, to differentiate it from little DI. Right? And, and explicit instruction. Little DI and explicit instruction are more similar. Big DI has components and features that are not necessarily shared. And Hughes said direct instruction, big DI, includes both the curriculum, which is the what to teach, and the instruction, which is how to teach. Whereas explicit instruction often focuses on the how. Here's what we need to do. Here's how we interact with kids, right? But we added, Engelman had an added component of the what, of the curriculum, of how to design instruction that ensures and maximizes kids' ability to learn that instruction. Um, 
When I talk about direct instruction, and I usually take three hours to do that, but okay, 45 minutes. Uh, where's my timer over there? Okay, I'm okay on time. Um, when I talk about it, I usually break it down into three components, sometimes four. Um, the organization and management of instruction, that's a lot of what Paula was talking about, I think. How you organize a classroom, how you create an environment, how you, you, know, how you engage routines, and I have a whole set of things for that. Instructional delivery, how do you interact with kids? How do you keep kids engaged? How do you provide feedback? Again, independent, but the thing that most people don't understand, the feature, is this feature of instructional design. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. And the, the one feature that, that is not obvious when you look at an implementation of direct instruction, you can't see it. You can't see the design. You really have to analyze um, the lessons in order to figure out what's there. You see the delivery. You don't see the design. Instructional design is all about reducing confusion, reducing ambiguity that will cause kids to be confused. Um, trying to set kids up for being successful. In fact, a lot of people talk about faultless communication, right? Designing communication so the kids can't get the answer wrong. You've set them up to get the answer right. And here's something that is very, very difficult to do when you are designing instruction, and that is to get into the shoes of the learner. I, I am a teacher preparation person. I was a university person running a program. It was a very difficult thing to do to teach my teachers, my prospective teachers, how to get into the shoes of the learner. Just because you solve this problem using this method doesn't mean that it's the best method for these kids. How do you, how do you um, figure out right, what a naive learner, and I'm gonna talk about naive learners, not low performing kids, Naive kids, kids who don't know, already don't know how to solve a problem. How do you design instruction to ensure that they're going to be successful? Well, here are five features. Five features that are involved, and this is going to be simplistic because it's 45 minutes. This 45 minutes thing, okay, fine. Um, really, five features that, will, that pertain to instructional design. One, you look at the general program design. How are the programs designed as a whole? Where are you starting? Where are you ending up? Um, one thing in a direct instruction program, you never see a scope and sequence that promises things it doesn't deliver. In the US, you see big, huge programs, and they say that they teach this and this and this and this and this. There's no way you could ever bring kids to mastery on the things that they say they teach. And the scope and sequences are designed for adoption committees. They're designed so that when a, a group of people sit down together and say, what program should we buy? Oh, I'm gonna buy the one that says it does the most. Yeah, doesn't happen. So general program design, we're gonna talk about generalizable strategies. Math strategies that, are, that get mileage. That, that if you're gonna design this strategy, it should apply to a, a huge range of examples. It shouldn't be a long strategy to apply to this problem and another strategy for this problem. But is there a way to design some generalizable strategies that will allow kids to solve problems um, that they've never seen before? Um, we'll get into that. Mastery. Uh, and well, master, not only mastering the skills that you're teaching, but mastering the prerequisite skills. The, the designer designs the strategy, right? does an analysis, designs the strategy, then breaks it down into component skills. I come from a special ed background, and in special education, we were always taught about um, task analysis, right? Just take this strategy and break it down into this and this and this and this. These guys go, do a lot of work before you ever get to the task analysis stage. Um, these are my mentors who are really quite brilliant. Um, and they do this analysis, and I'll, I'll give you some examples of that. And then you teach the prerequisite skills, and then you put them together. Last, we, everybody talks about extensive practice and review. I'm going to tell you that in, 19, in the 1960s, before most of you were born, um, Engelman designed a way to um, provide 
different types of practice, cumulative introduction and review, he is spaced practice. He did all this in the 1960s when he wrote a program. Um, and last is integration. There's nothing that is, is meant to be taught and, and to remain in isolation. We don't teach isolated skills. We may introduce a skill in isolation and then, use, and then have an opportunity to integrate that skill with other things. All right, let me see how far I can get with these. Here we go. Coordination, program organization, has to do with paying attention to the relationships among the many strategies that you're teaching, the content that you're teaching. It has to do with the designing instruction and assessment, right? Coordinating instruction and assessment. Um, if you've taught this, then you need to find a way to assess, to determine whether or not the kids actually learned it. There is a huge assessment component in all of, all of the direct instruction programs. And last, there's something uh, that we started attending to. I don't know, has anybody here heard the term spiral curriculum? So have you ever heard that term where you keep repeating it over and over? Here's what is the problem with spiral curriculum. You have a fractions chapter in second grade, and it's unit four, and then you never see it again until unit four of third grade, and unit four of fourth grade, and unit four of fifth grade. That's a spiral. We don't use a spiral curriculum we, because we want kids to master whatever it is we've taught, the designers. So it, we use a strand curriculum that starts here and moves through here, and I'll show you what I mean in a second. Um, this was a study that was published in the Federation, American Federation of Teachers, and, and these people looked at the um, topics in 21 states. It says uh, mathematics topics intended at each grade by at least two-thirds of these of the US states. These are the topics. You don't have to know what the topics are. Look at the boxes. Every, every single year has the same boxes and some. That, that's, this is different from that. This is a strand curriculum. I'm gonna start here, and then I'm gonna move to here, and I'm gonna move to here, but I don't have to repeat everything I've taught every year because I brought kids to mastery. So spiral curriculum, I mean, it sounds good. Oh, yeah, let's review every year. You can't wait a year to review fractions, right? Because what happens with the next year is you have to review what happened the previous year because kids have forgotten it. So you start backing up. So direct instruction de designers design only in a strand, using a strand kind of formula. There's a, tra a strand track. I'm gonna use them interchangeably, those words. Um, the, there's a tr there are general track characteristics. One prerequisite per skill per track. The track extends over days and weeks. Exercises within the track change. So the beginning of the track may be very teacher-led, and then as the track moves down lessons, the teacher um, support is faded, and the exercises require more of the students. This is systematically built into the program. And then the tracks are integrated with each other. So again, I'm, I put a master's care. People use the term prerequisite skill, they use the term component skill, and they use the term pre-skill. Those all, in my mind, are, they're all the same thing, right? They're what you need to know before I introduce a strategy to you. Um, this, is, this was from my friend Bernie Kelly. This was sort of the, a rough draft of how they were designing the um, algebra program. Where, here are the topics on the left hand, left hand column. Here are the, here's how the topics, here's where they're gonna move, here's where they're gonna integrate. This is how the direct instruction designers conceptualize the level of a program. Here's what it looked like when it was finished. This is what's in the teacher's guide. This kind of, you can see the topics, you can see the tracks. What you don't see in this figure is you don't see explicitly the integration, but they are, all those tracks are integrated. Lesson features. In every DI lesson, um, and this is very different from most lessons in most curricula, only 10% of the information in a lesson is new. Only 10%. The new material is presented consecutively for at least three lessons, depending on how difficult it is. All the prerequisite skills are mastered prior to applying them. You don't teach a prerequisite skill and the application of that skill in the same lesson. You make sure the kids understand, here's this component, this prerequisite, 
Now, later on, we're going to put them all together. Um, there are about six to 10 ongoing strands. So a lesson isn't 45 minutes on one topic. A lesson is going to have a little bit of different topics at different places in the strand. Um, and the cumulative introduction and the review is ever present and apparent in everything that they do. Here's what, here's what sort of, you have a rope in reading, well you kind of have this in, in direct instruction. These are all the strands for a given program um, over the course of, of a year. And in any one given lesson, you're gonna work on problem solving, you're gonna work on ratios, you're gonna work on geometry, and you're gonna work on money. And you're gonna work on those little exercises, right? A little bit. Some are gonna be early in the strand, some of them are gonna be later in the strand. That's how the lessons are put together. So it's not, I'm gonna teach a math lesson, and this is the topic, and I'm gonna, you know, it's 45 minutes, and then I'm gonna move on to the next topic the next day. Doesn't look like that. Strategy instruction. The strategy instruction is all explicit, very clear, it's systematic, and it's generalizable. Um, explicit, I'm assuming research ed people, explicit, it is step by step by step is very clear. It's a conspicuous procedure. There's no guessing, there's no um, trying to figure it out. It is, first you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this, right? It's systematic in the sense that you've taken those prerequisite and components, and now you're putting them together into the strategy, but here's how valuable that is. When kids make errors, you can figure out which component they may be faltering in. You know how to correct their mistake because you can identify exactly where that mistake happened, right? You can analyze the errors, you can figure out how to, um, um, correct for those errors, they're definite correction procedures. Those correction procedures fall under delivery. We teach people how to correct any of the errors that, that are made. We, um, diagnosis and remediation is different from corrections. Diagnosis and remediation is sort of later on, you're seeing kids' written work, and you're, you're seeing patterns of errors, and you have to pull back and see what is it that, that the kids are missing. But I mentioned this earlier. All the strategies, as best they can, are generalizable. You get a lot of mileage out of those strategies. They're not, a bunch of steps aren't designed for one little piece. And, and I will show some examples of that. Oh, here's one. Oh, as a matter of fact, here's one now. Um, traditionally, in the US, there were seven different strategies for calculating volume for um, three-dimensional figures. There they are, formulas to, formulas to calculate volume. Remember I said that what our designers do, what the direct instruction de designers do, is they sort of do this analysis that precedes designing a strategy. When they analyzed these seven formulas, they saw some similarities that they could cap capitalize on, and they could reduce the, the seven various um, um, formulas for strategies to a very simple variation of base times height. So if you calculate it, if you wanted to calculate the volume of a box, it's base times height. If you wanted to calculate the volume of a wedge in a cylinder, it's base times height. And if you wanted to calculate the um, volume of a pyramid, a rectangular pyramid or a triangular pyramid, it's one third times the of base times height and a cone, and then sphere is two thirds, so uh, base times height. So it's variation of one strategy gets you there instead of having kids memorize seven different formulas. That's the value. That's when, I, when I'm talking about being generalizable, getting mileage. Why teach those seven formulas that are hard to understand if you can teach one and the variation of one? Um, and this is what it looks like in, in the elementary program. It's explicit, it's systematic, and it's generalizable. It looks like this. Here's a box. You want to figure out the number of cubes that fit in the box. When you find the number of cubes that fit in the box, you find the volume. So there's a definition of what volume is. Here's the equation um, for the volume of a box. Volume equals the area of base times height. The base is the bottom side of the box. The bottom so um, side is shaded. The bottom side of the box is two units wide and four units long. The area of the base is eight squares. 
you can identify what the prerequisite skill would have had to be before I got here, right? Kids would have to know what area is and how to calculate area. You would never introduce this until they're absolutely skilled at calculating area. And it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. This is an introductory lesson for calculating volume. In the introductory lessons, the teacher's going through step by step by step. Later that phase, right, once the strategy is taught. Um, the prerequisite skills, you, you, the, the designers figure out the generalizable strategy, and then they um, calculate the, um, pre, then they uh, design the prerequisite skills, and they figure out what component skills, like I said, kids needed to know area before they could work on volume. For the example of sub subtraction with regrouping, just, just, just plain old column subtraction, um, they had to write, a, when they wrote a remedial program about subtraction, when kids couldn't subtract, they had to really break down well, what are the kids missing, right? What kinds of errors are the kids making? Do the kids understand that you start from the right and go to the left? In your case, that way. Um, do the under kids understand when to regroup? Do the, and, and you know what happens with some of this computation um, instruction? Have you ever seen a, a, a worksheet for kids learning how to regroup and every single problem requires them to regroup from the tens? Oh, cross out the tens, subtract, put the ten, right, with every single one. But what is missing is when do you do this and when don't you do this? Kids don't have to pay, if every single problem just is the same routine, they never have to pay attention to when. So they end up, if you stuck in two problems that didn't require regrouping in that long list, you'd have kids making errors. You'd have kids still crossing out the 10 and putting, putting, carrying the one, putting the one over. Do they know from where? Lots of errors get made with larger problems about how to, you know, what column do you take from, right? These are common errors for just column subtraction that can be prevented if you teach it right. Does the student know how to make the appropriate conversions? So when they wrote the remedial program for, for subtraction, they had to go back and say, which of these prerequisite skills do the kids have? Which ones are they missing? Now let's teach the strategy. Um, practice and review. You've heard these terms. It's cumulative. Nothing in a direct instruction program dies. Nothing. In fact, this is, it's pertinent because when people are teaching a direct instruction program, because it's so well integrated, you can't get to lesson 62 unless the kids have mastered one through 61. As a consultant, I might come into a classroom using direct instruction, I'm looking at the kids, and I'm seeing, wow, their error rates are really high. They were never really brought to mastery, right? Okay, I'm seeing a 10 minute, am I? Okay, good, okay. I'm not, uh, uh, um, they were never really brought to mastery, and I, as a consultant, have to say, you have to move back 20 lessons. The kids didn't reach mastery, and these programs require that kids reach mastery at every single lesson. And you do what it takes in order for them to get there. Um, it's scaffolded, and example selection is critical. Um, well, let me back out. The number of examples is critical. What, remember I mentioned just having a set of examples where that's all they do is cross out from the tens column. So those are called introductory examples. You want some examples to give kids, make sure the kids are fluent with the routine. But as soon as you can, you have to stick in discrimination examples that let you know whether the kids know when to apply the strategy and when not to. You have to get that test. You have to have discrimination um, examples in there. And then there's a whole lot written about the sequence of examples and what makes sense in a sequence. Um, it's scaffolded. That I, I referred to this earlier. The teacher starts out um, very teacher-directed, starting to fade, right? Guiding and using guided practice. So it's, it's, it's hardcore teacher-led. It's, it's less structured. It's guided practice, it's independent. Nothing should be um, assigned as independent work that you're not sure kids can already do. It's practice, independent work is practice. If you're wrong, which you might be, you can come back and got, um, engage in guided practice, watch kids, and then correct their errors. But you want student success 
to be maintained from while teacher assistance is being faded. That's the goal. Here's an introductory set of examples I mentioned to you before. Here's a discrimination set of examples. They can't be written in a predictable order. Kids have to pay attention to the example to get the answer right. So discrimination pro problems are absolutely essential. Um, here's an example. Kids are learning about in intersect and parallel, and they have introductory examples for intersect, introductory examples for parallel, and then discrimination practice, right? Where, where they have to discriminate what's parallel and what's not parallel. Okay, let's see if I can do this, because this is the last thing I was going to do. This is integration. Um, the direct instruction designers actually designed a pretty generalizable approach to solving word problems. Um, it's not the keyword method. It's not um, some of these other methods that happen. It's not discovery. We don't set, sit kids down and say, figure out how to solve this problem. We actually teach them how to solve the problem. Here's an example. Here's a big, long word problem. It's all about two parks. It's all about trees. And there are a bunch of questions at the bottom that say, what's the total number of trees that were planted? Were more maple trees planted in this park or that park? And in which park were more trees planted? Here's where it starts. It starts with an arrow and some rules. Did it work? Oh, yes. OK. So. The rules are that the total goes at the end of the arrow, and then there's a rule. When the total is given, you have to subtract. When the total is not given, you have to add. Okay? Simple rules. Identifying whether there's a total, and then determining the operation based on that. That's just the basic sort of setting up of the problem. You graphically represent the problem, and then you determine the appropriate operation. So it, they start out simple. J is less than M. Everybody, which is more, J or M? M. M goes at the bottom. R is more than P, which is the big number, R or P? R. You got it. T R is 12 larger than V, which is more, R or V? R. R. V and 12 larger. Just basic. This is just getting kids to set up the problem. Then that strategy applies to comparison problems, sequence of events problems, classification problems, multi-step problems, and eventually ratio problems. One strategy where you determine what the total is, and the total being big number, we sometimes we use big number, which doesn't mean the biggest number in the problem, the biggest quantity, you can solve all these different types of problems. S is starting out early, comparison, S is 15 more than B, um, which is more, S or B? S, S is more, 15 more than B. B is 77. Okay, you have two small numbers and you have the total. What operation do you choose? How do you solve it? You have to add. Got it? Fran, five minutes. Ooh, Fran is 14 years older than Ann. Ann is 13 years old. How old is Fran? Which, who is older, Fran or Ann? Fran. Um, here we go. There's Fran, there's Anne. Fourteen, you're right, 14 years older. Two small numbers, a big number. Okay. Mark, Mark can lift eight pounds less than Sonia. Mark can lift 105 pounds. How much can Sonia lift? Who lifts more, Sonia or Mark? Oh, Sonia. Mark can lift eight pounds less. This is where you're teaching kids to Read the words and understand the words and then represent the words. Here you go. Sonia can, Sony can lift more, right? Yeah. Um, this is the sequence of events. I'm going to go fast because I only have a couple minutes. Here's classification. A hotel is going to buy 112 pieces of furniture. It needs to buy 57 couches. The hotel will buy chairs for the rest. How many chairs will the hotel buy? You need to know the prerequisite skill for this is knowing um, that furniture is the bigger term for chairs and uh, is the superlative, not the superlative, what's the word I want? Is the, the so there's a word, I'm missing it. Anyway, furniture's here, chairs and, and tables are here, um, chairs and couches are here. 112, 57, you have to subtract. Um, then you can do the same thing to tables. You put your information in a table, and the table works, the arrows work across, and the arrows work down. And it is 
elegant. So you take the information from that long word problem, you fill it in, you apply those rules. Do you have the total or do you, uh, if you have the total, you subtract. If you don't, you have to add. You can fill it and now you can answer all the questions. And not only can you do it with plain old simple computation problems, but you can also um, do it with ratio problems. A factory mine, okay? Factory makes cars and SUVs. It makes five SUVs for every three cars. If the factory made 600 vehicles last year, how many cars and how many SUVs did it make? Here's the table. It's a classification ratio table, right? You need to know classification. You need to know that vehicles is the class, this is the word I wanted, uh, you know, um, a, a superordinate class to cars and SUVs, right? You set up the table. You know how to work ratios. That's the prerequisite skill. You can determine by um, the ratios by multiplying by a fraction equal to one, and you can get your answer. Instructional design is a necessary but not sufficient component of direct instruction. It is the least understood component of direct instruction, but all the components have to be in play in order for, for kids to be successful. Did I do it? Really? I made it through 45 minutes. telling you it was a challenge. That was a challenge. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marcy. It was amazing. Uh, and uh, actually, you have like one minute to spare. So uh, you did it brilliantly. And uh, para, el, para el resto, vamos a, insisto, en la página web vamos a publicar después esta referencia, el material complementario va a estar en la página de ResearchEd para que puedan revisar. So, can, can I hear yes, you I got a minute, so it's all yours. Okay, here's one thing. Here's one thing that people wonder about. So these direct instruction programs are designed and they're designed using these principles. And how can these principles be useful if you don't have the design, right? I mean, if you don't have the programs, what are you supposed to do with this information? Well, it, in a lot of ways, I spend a lot of time helping people evaluate their curricula according to the principles of instructional design. You have to determine whether your curricula um, can be modified what you have to add to it, what you might subtract, or whether or not it's so far gone that you really do need to pick up something else, right? Um, but, but it gives you a way to design interventions. It gives you a way to evaluate curricula. It gives you, it's more than just go buy these programs, which of course you don't have access to in Spanish. So I believe the information is still useful. Okay, that's it.